You're, you're alive now. All right, thanks, Sherry. And uh, firstly, welcome everyone that's on the podcast now. This is Mark Young from Bridgepoint Capital, and we're very fortunate today to have an incredible group that's going to describe or update us on providing liquidity or tokenization, in this case, in a case study on fine art. So art typically is an illiquid investment for people. And through tokenization, they've created a way for this illiquid investment to be something that has liquidity on it. It's very edgy, very innovative. And I think it's the future of owning fine art. And we're going to have experts in the space talk about tokenization and fine art in general and why fine art is an important asset to hold. It's also something that tends to do well in inflation, which clearly we're at 40 year highs in the US today regarding inflation. It also tends to recover sooner in recessions. So, in the case of the US economy, we have this interesting dynamic. If the employment report is going to come out tomorrow, and the employment report will probably be above expectations. The Fed will be meeting next week. At the moment, the market is fully expecting the Fed to raise rates another 75 basis points. So you have all these confluence of events that are push-pull related to inflation and deflation. And we have this interesting investment opportunity called fine art. And it probably, for many people, is a way to enhance the efficiency of your current portfolios. So that's why we're doing this. And again, we have some really amazing speakers, and we'll get to them very shortly. But Jerry, go to the next slide, please. So we can't have a presentation without a disclaimer, and this is our disclaimer. So basically what it says in a nutshell is Bridgepoint is encouraged and allowed to do financial education, but we're not today intending to do what I'll call investment advice. If you take something that you perceive to be investment advice, we 100% recommend you share that with your investment advisor, investment professionals, and in ensure that what you're hearing and doing is fully understood. But the point is, we're in the financial education business for today. So, Jerry, if you'd be kind enough, go to the next slide. So in the spirit of financial education, these are the next slide, is, and as well as this slide, are really at a super high level, what we strongly believe are approaches to managing your wealth. So that little silly chart on the left, which is a, a stool with three legs, your net worth, which is a combination of your liquid or investable assets, as well as your illiquid or non-investable assets, that's your net worth. And we have approaches to help people do that efficiently. We also, just for the podcast listeners benefit, we offer free consulting to share our best practices and how to do that well. And I can tell you it's a system that has been refined over many, many years. It works very well. And if people are interested in getting exposure to that, just let us know. We're happy to provide that education session on a one-on-one -on -one basis with you. But bottom line, your net worth in combination with the three legs of the stool. So trust and estate planning is a very important element to wealth preservation. As I tell people, in America, anybody can sue anybody at any time for any reason. So it's important that you have a financial moat around your investments so that you can minimize the risks of losing your hard-earned wealth by lawsuits, whether they're valid or frivolous. Uh, the second leg of that stool is tax planning. And again, I spent seven years at PwC. I've done taxes, and I can tell you, with zero reservations, anybody can fill out a tax form. That's not where the skill lies. The skill lies in tax planning so that when you have a future taxable event, you have the ability to structure it in a way to minimize your tax burden. So tax planning is a very important element to maximize your net worth. And that's something we can be helpful in. And lastly, it's insurance. 
and I'm not an insurance broker, but I can promise you certain types of insurance products, specifically private placement life insurance, which is this podcast session we had a few weeks back, is a way to create another tax for vehicle, much like your 401k, your IRAs, your Roths, et cetera, give you the ability to have investments growing on a tax for basis in a vehicle. So private life is another vehicle to give you tax for ability to grow your investment. So that to us is the key elements of your, your, your uh, private wealth maximization. Jerry, next slide, please. So this really is a great link to what we're about to discuss, which is fine art and tokenization. So basically, if you look on the right, you see two pictures. The first picture is a pie chart and it's a little hard to read, but basically over 90% of your returns and in investments can be attributed or traced back to your asset allocation. So that's what matters. That's what you want to get right. So things like security selection and market timing don't move the revenue needle. Yeah, they're entertaining. They're fun. I use Jim Cramer as an example of market timing. He always advocates his deal of the day, buy this, sell that. And they've proven over and over again that his methodology doesn't beat a passive index. So a lot of times he's advocating the S&P 500 stocks, what's rich, what's cheap. The fact is, if you own an index, you would do better than Jim Cramer. That's just the reality. So focus on what matters, which is getting your asset allocation right. So that being said, to the right, you have three different portfolios. You have a 100% equity portfolio, which generates a long-term return of somewhere between 11 and 12%, but has high volatility associated with it. So its volatility exceeds its return. That's not, in our view, an efficient investment. You can have a 100% bond portfolio, which has a less return than equities, and it's less volatile, but it's still a return where volatility exceeds, excuse me, a portfolio that volatility exceeds return. And then you look at the chart with the box on the left, that's the quadrant you want to be in. You want to be in the upper left quadrant where you have the highest return with least risk. This portfolio, which is something that we advocate, Basically, equities can, and if you can take a lockup, half of your equities can and should be in venture capital and private equity, and relative value or market neutral is basically hedge funds. So half of this efficient portfolio is an alternative investment over 50%. And what we're going to see today fits into that category. And I will also tell you, this is an approach that was taken – by me at McKinsey, overseeing the private wealth of the McKinsey partners. And coincidentally, the same approach, the advisory board of the McKinsey Investment Office is also the advisors to the Yale Endowment. So they have very, very similar philosophies and approach to investing. And the Yale Endowment is the darling of the endowment investment community. Their returns the last 12 months in 2021 was up about 32%. This is a portfolio that has over 30 billion in it. So yes, it works and yes, it's for size, but you have the ability to essentially mimic that strategy. So that's just introduction to what we're about to cover, which is tokenization through fine art. Uh, Jerry, next slide, please. Okay, now I get to introduce what's most important to the people in the audience, the speakers today. So. I'm going to ask Elizabeth first to introduce herself, tell us a little about herself, and then we'll go down the list. So, Elizabeth? Thank you very much, Mark. It's a, a, a delight to be here today. A quick overview of who I am and what I do. I'm Managing Director of Winston Art Group. We're the largest independent art advisory and appraisal firm in the U.S. We've got 11 offices worldwide. We have three pillars that we work with, the first being independent appraisals for all purposes. We do about $10 billion worth of appraisals each year. The second area we cover is, is advisory, and that is acting as our client's advocate when they're buying or selling works of art across 75 different categories of collecting. We do hundreds of millions of dollars worth of transactions each year. And the third area is collection management. So how do you build and maintain 
and grow the value of a collection while it's under your care, custody, and control. Uh, we've always been super interested in tech and how tech influences the art market. I've known Nana Decking for years, for decades, uh, and we have decided recently to do a joint venture to do some very interesting projects together in the art field, uh, leveraging our expertise and his group's technological innovations. All right, well, thank you. Um, I guess, Nanny, would you like to go next? Sure, Mark. Uh, thank you, Bridgeburn Capital, for inviting us. And uh, indeed, Liz and I go back a very long time in the art market. I've been working in the art market as well. And uh, the moment I moved to New York from, uh, from Holland, uh, the first person I was met professionally was actually Liz von Habsburg. And I have a, a lot of uh, respect for her and for the Winston Art Group. The reason why uh, will most likely become clear very soon. Uh, so after a long career in the art market, um, five years ago, six years ago, actually, I started, I founded Artry. And Artry became the first company in the world to use blockchain uh, technology to secure uh, trusted information about artworks. So we became the first uh, blockchain secured registration of artworks. And for that, I realized it's not about what art we believes about an artwork or what our technology can capture. It's about what kind of information do you capture? And I'm very proud to say that we were the first to collaborate with Christie's, the world's largest uh, auction house in the world, to capture an entire auction of a collection of very, very important American art, the Absworth collection on the blockchain. And what did that say? That information that we captured was the information from the specialist at Christie's who did due diligence on one of the most important collections of American art that was ever sold in the world. And that's what we're after. We're after using this technology to create a reassurance for people interacting with these artworks, whether it's buying them from an auction house or in the future uh, invest in an artwork through an art fund or all kinds of uh, wonderful projects we're collaborating with together with, with Liz and, and Winston with the Art We Winston joint venture. Uh, so it's all about creating that reassurance about information uh, about an artwork and then using the technology. So for us, a partnership with, with Winston Art Group was extremely important because where do you find more impartial, more neutral, more independent information than from a large, appraisal firm that has no vested interest in the valuations they, they come up with, uh, but do actually real due diligence and independent due diligence on artwork. So maybe that is a starting point. Well, I'll just say a couple of quick things. Firstly, knowledge is power. And you certainly have vast knowledge about art in general and specific pieces as well. And clearly the difference between you know, a high-end piece and an ordinary piece, if I can even say that by the same artist, can vary dramatically. So you really need to have the experts to give you the advice and counsel so that you invest prudently. If you do invest prudently, that's a big if, the returns that I've seen in the fine art market are very compelling, very attractive. So I'm not gonna be the spoiler here and share what will come up very shortly, but the returns in fine art are very impressive. So that being said, let's go to the next slide. Okay, um, I'm gonna call, call Lawrence if I may do that. Uh, we didn't plan this in advance, but Lawrence, would you like to describe the slide and, and a little bit more about Alpha Innovations? And tell, sure. us, tell us where you're based, by the way, I'm very jealous. <laughs> Yeah, sure, we're actually based out of Bermuda, which is uh, which is nice. I'm a I'm a bad Canadian that hates cold weather, um, but uh, uh, so a little bit about Alpha Innovations. Uh, we uh, we formed Alpha Innovations uh, back in 2018. Prior to that, I spent 12 years at SAC Capital and Point 72, and before that, I started up the Alternatives Program for one of the big Canadian pension funds. Um, but Alpha Innovations was really built on. Alpha, that's, it's in our name. 
and identifying unique sources of alpha uh, and repackaging that alpha in, in, in innovative products to uh, uh, to uh, you know for our institutional investors. So we've got a few different business lines. One is really um, allocating capital to top uh, investment managers in multi-strategy products that we're that we're coming up with. Um, but we're also part we also partner with talented PMs, uh, portfolio managers, to help them scale their businesses on our on our different platforms. Uh, running a regulated and building a regulated asset management business uh, in in these in these days is it's a, it's a it's a real um, it's a it's a real effort and you know we'll partner with PMs to help them um, you know build their businesses and, and deliver their alpha to to investors including our investors. Um, I think what's relevant to in this. Um, uh, in this webinar, though, is w the work that we've been doing on tokenization in recent years. Um, you know, when I was back at the pension fund, one of the issues that we had was the inability to easily rebalance uh, your alts portfolio if it's if it's not liquid alts. So whether that being you know real estate, VC, or or, um, or private equity, you, know, you wait you had to wait till really until those investments rolled off before you uh, before you um, you know before you could rebalance. So we've been doing a lot of work uh, you know in recent years on on how do we you know how do we how do how could we create liquidity in illiquid assets like like these? And you know, art is an example of an illiquid asset. Um, you know, maybe um, uh, so. You know, maybe Jerry, if you can just flip to the next slide, perhaps. So we, for the past few years, we've been doing a lot of work on utilizing blockchain technology in order to uh, help create liquidity in these illiquid assets. Because if I was at back at the, the pension fund and you, and you said, Larry, you can rebalance your portfolio any day of the week, that's a game changer. Um, you know, so um, so that brings into the concept of tokenization, and I'll, I'll geek out for a few minutes here because that kind of sets the stage for uh, for what some of the other speakers will be speaking about as well. But you know, tokenization really means uh, you know recording the ownership of an asset, i.e., an investment fund, perhaps um, on a on a um, immutable ledger. Okay, so it's a fancy word for a database that cannot be altered. Um, now, what's interesting is that, in, so we, you know, we're a, a prolific in, um, issuer of investment funds of various types, um, but these are securities. Okay, unlike a like a, a cryptocurrency, okay, which isn't a security, you can go trade that all you want to whoever you want. And um, but when you're talking about securities, it's a much different and more complicated, uh, you know, ball game. So with tokenization, though, how this works is that there's something called a smart contract that can govern there any kind of uh, restrictions on transfer. So a good example is if you're a U.S. investor and you participate in a Reg D offer. Offering, you can't sell that for a year and then there's you know and it varies by jurisdiction by jurisdiction so all of that logic can get uh, programmed into a smart contract so let's so what does that mean to if i wanted to sell you know uh, my tokenized call it a fund to to mark okay the smart contract would look at me and say hey how long has larry held this for it, in, in given in his jurisdiction, okay, what is what is the amount of time he's supposed to hold it? Does he have legal title to it? Um, and what other and there could be other restrictions on transfer. And then the smart contract would also go to Mark and say, hey, you know, Mark in his jurisdiction, oh, he, maybe he can't even buy that this kind of an asset, okay? Or if he can, uh, you know, maybe he doesn't have the uh, in, the the investor accreditation sta uh, status that would allow him in his jurisdiction to, um, you know, to actually buy that token that from me. So if all the conditions are met, I'm able to sell it and Mark is able to buy it, only then can that be uh, transferred. My token be, can be transferred to Mark. Now, traditionally, there, there are secondary markets for, at, for illiquid assets like investment funds. Uh, they tend to trade at very large bid offer spreads. The, the friction, including legal friction, is enormous, um, and it's you know it's possible, but it's not a liquid market because it's so hard to do. With this, if those restrictions in tra of transfer are met, that can happen instantaneously 
on a blockchain. Um, so, and there's several marketplaces that exist now for these assets. There's a few in the U.S. that are regulated. Uh, there's m uh, many more in uh, Europe and in uh, and in Asia. Um, but it's still it's still early games. Now, the one of the uh, the issues in a lot of these venues is secondary market liquidity. Just because something can trade doesn't mean it can. That that doesn't mean it will. Um, so we're we've got some uh, some side projects where we're uh, looking on looking at developing technologies to bring secondary market uh, liquidity to these tokenized illiquid assets. At the end of the day, you know, as an asset manager, I I you know, first of all, I have to produce alpha. Okay, nobody's going to buy my funds and normal and share form or token form if the alpha isn't there all right but by by adding this liquidity element at least to the closed-ended funds okay open-ended funds the use case isn't as as uh, uh you know as important but for a closed-ended funds a five ten year fund i can go to an investor and say hey you can invest in my fund it's a 10-year closed-ended fund or you can invest in the token of my fund and have the potential to trade out of that, you know, you know, when tomorrow or depending on whenever your regulatory restrictions, uh, you know, lapse, that is that's a game changer. As an investor, I love free options, and what this provides to investors is a free option. Invest in the share if you want, but why would you when you can invest in a um, a, 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 in a token instead of that share that you can trade out of? So maybe Mark, I'll just take a, a pause there and. Uh, and See where you want to go from here. Well, Larry, you did a great job of explaining why tokenizing, if I call that the word, these illiquid investments creates another element of potential alpha for what you're doing. And you're all about alpha. Just for, I guess, the people in the audience benefit, I'm just going to ask you another question. Larry, this is education. So how would you define alpha for the audience so that they appreciate what you're striving to achieve? Sure. Uh, for me, is uh, alpha is returns uh, that are in um, that are unrelated to a benchmark. So if I am a if I'm a long short equity uh, portfolio manager, I, I'm looking at, you know, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I want to look at what how do I how do I produce, you know, what's my returns in excess of the market is the easiest way to look at it. Or if I'm a fixed income manager uh, relative to some fixed income benchmark. Okay. Above and beyond what people would get on a passive basis or your, a peer group basis is above and beyond. Yeah. So that's, I'll just yeah. say how you distinguish yourself and attract net new assets and get compensated accordingly. So this is a really important priority for you to have alpha. So I, I get it. Jerry, I'm going to ask you to advance the slide, please. Okay, I think we've covered this a little bit, but in the interest of sharing the airtime, uh, Nanny, would you like to share your thoughts and comments on the benefits of tokenization? I'm giving you the cold call here, but would you like to discuss this a little bit? Sure, sure. And I'm sure Liz wants to uh, tap into this subject as well, because please. that's pretty much what we're doing together. Um, what I really appreciated, Larry, is when, when, when he explained the immutability of information. Um, because you can talk about technology and blockchain technology as long as you want. But as long as this technology is not fed with knowledge, real market knowledge, and the trust systems that are behind that market, uh, the whole technology doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so I'm very happy that Larry started with explaining the technology. And I know that he's one of those people who really understands how important it is when you deal with a new kind of asset class, that you deal with the best kind of artworks in this asset class. And that's also why I wanted to team up with Liz and her team when I was looking for a credible partner to create blockchain secured registrations of information. And I want to put it a little bit further by, by, by just going on the tokenization part. And Liz will definitely talk uh, a lot about the rest. Uh, so if you talk about the tokenization that takes place, there's another kind of tokenization that takes place as well. So what we do at R3 is that we capture all the due diligence information that's really meticulous, meticulously done by the many experts that work for Liz and her group. And every step on the way of the due diligence of that artwork is captured by our technology. 
And there's a whole sign of procedure, et cetera, et cetera, that you really get the reassurance as an investor in the potential artwork is that you're dealing with the right kind of stuff and that the asset is, has actually been meticulously checked before anything else happens. You know, why trade an artwork if it's not the right kind of artwork? Why don't, why would you invest in an artwork if it's not the right kind of artwork? And that's where Liz and I team up. Luckily enough, I've had vast experience in the art market at the highest echelon of the market. Otherwise, I would never have met Liz. <laughs> uh, so I know that market. And we all know that there are attributes that create value for an artwork. Attributes such as provenance, uh, who are the other collectors who, who buy those kind of, of, of artworks. And that's something that Liz can talk about. But, you know, you, you have to make sure when you enter a whole new kind of technology, a whole new uh, field of investment, that you deal with not only the right kind of technology, not only with the right financial experts, but also with the experts in the field that can guide you through this new asset class. So, Liz, maybe that's where, where you can come in. Sure. Just to take a tiny step back, uh, um, talking about barriers to entry, and I think when we're talking about investing in art, when both Nana and I started in the art market, maybe 30 years ago or so, uh, we weren't allowed to talk about investing in art, but it clearly, I would say 99% of the people that we work with say to us when we buy something for them, is it going to go up in value? So the barriers to entry for more institutional investors or for many collectors are that there has been traditionally in the market a lack of transparency. Uh, and what Nana and we are doing, what Artery and Winston are doing, is, is lowering those barriers. So institutional investors and collectors, long-term collectors and new collectors, feel that there's transparency in what we're doing because the data that we are placing into those tokenized due diligence tokens contains uh, data that's based on over 50 um, data points that Winston Art Group and our team um, review before we say to, to our investors, we think this is a good work of art to invest in. So I think it's important to note that uh, uh, there, there have been these barriers to entry. There's been uh, no way to really mitigate risk until you start talking about tokenizing these due diligence tokens. So that is a, a point I wanted to bring up. And also just to note something on, on Nana's behalf, Nana was uh, in the art market for a long time. He was actually the head of private sales for Sotheby's for a number of years. So together with Nana's expertise and our um, team's expertise, we know where all the great artworks are, and we know how to source artworks, which is another way to, to mitigate risk. We know how to source the, uh, the types of artworks that will be um, at, the, at a reasonable value and that have the best chance of going up in value over time. Yeah, maybe one thing I can add, Lid, this is the investment decisions uh, should also be backed by data. Yes. Um, I made a very, very uh, determined decision some four years ago to build up the largest database of transaction data in the art market. Um, it's actually used by the Art Basel report. Claire McAndrew uses, who's a very, very important uh, data analytic. She uses our data when she creates the Art Basel, the UBS Art Basel report, which is every year one of those reports, every art collector, every art dealer looks at to see what happens with certain kind of art over the last, over the last year. So Liz and her team also have access to the data that we have acquired. They have their own databases as well, of course, after so many years of, uh, of expertise and, and acting at the highest levels uh, within the art market. Um, but I'm very keen on making sure that people are going to invest in art coming from the financial world and don't necessarily know the art market very well, that they see that it's not only expertise, it's, there's also a whole set of data behind uh, decisions you can make. Well said. I have to just build on one point that Elizabeth said, and it applies to all the speakers. You're all way, way too humble. You guys are world-class masters of what you're doing. And it's okay every now and then to tip your cap and say, yeah, I'm really good at what I do, because you really are. And we're delighted to have you here. So you don't have to be humble or modest because you've earned all of our respect. So I just I have to just say that. But Jerry, if you'd be kind enough to go to the next slide.
Okay, investing in art. So we've given so far a little bit of rationalization and knowledge about tokenization from what Larry shared with us. And now we've talked about what information is needed to make sound investment decisions. But now we're going to talk about actually putting your money to work in art. So investing in art. And Elizabeth, I'll, I'll let you start if that's okay. And tell us why we should be thinking about art as an investment. Absolutely. Uh, I think that we, as I mentioned before, all of the, the collectors that we work with really do think about investments in art as a, a viable alternate asset class. Uh, and something you mentioned before, Mark, when you're talking about equities and so on is diversification is key. Same thing in the art market. If you want to invest in art in a really successful way, one way to mitigate risk is to diversify the types of artworks you include in your portfolio. Um, in terms of how you construct the portfolio, we feel strongly that it should be a mix between, if you're investing in modern and contemporary art, it should be a mix between blue chip art, mid-career artists, and emerging artists. And that way you are mitigating that risk because there are different uh, potential returns for each category. Obviously, blue chip are the well-established, internationally recognized artists who have a strong secondary or auction market and a strong primary market. Mid-career artists are those that have maybe one or two galleries that represent them, uh, have some secondary market, a uh, very strong primary market. And then the emerging art artists are the ones where there is um, really the highest percentage upside, but also the <laughs> highest risk profile. So you want to have a nice mix of, of all those different categories when you're constructing your portfolio. In terms of where we find these works of art, I touched on that before, between Nana and his years of experience with private clients and their collections, and our team that, uh, as I mentioned before, has does $10 billion worth of appraisals a year and has wide ranging um, clients uh, across the world who are collecting. We have incredible inroads into wonderful private works of art that are fresh to the market. Uh, in terms of potential returns, and then I'm going to turn it over to Nana because I know he has lots to say on this as well. Um, you'll see in the next slide, we'll delve more deeply into that. But uh, at the top level of the market, the, the top 100 performing artists have over the past 20 years outpaced the S&P returns significantly, almost, uh, yes, over double uh, in percentage points. And we'll talk about that a little more on the next slide. Nana, what do you have to add? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, while talking about the potential returns, um, I already mentioned that there are certain attributes that create value to an artwork. And if I may talk about my personal experience, yes, I've been very lucky uh, being a specialist in French Impressionist art that I was actually dealing at the highest echelon of the art market for some of the biggest collectors in the world. And their collection their collections uh, gained a lot of value over the years. I vividly remember uh, talking to one of the collectors who I advised who told me, none of that Monet that you told me to buy. Uh, somebody told me it's an unfinished work. Uh, what on earth have I done? I'm trying to sell it. I want to sell it. And I told him, no, just keep it. And that artwork has gone up in value so tremendously that that's the kind of, of opportunity that I feel more people should have as well. But why was I so determined in telling him, no, that artwork is actually finished artwork. There's a lot to say about it because I actually happen to know all the information that's out there about that specific artwork. And that's exactly what's so important that we want to capture that information that when you interact with Nana Decking, who tries to sell you an artwork for a lot of money, that is not only Nana Decking who you have to trust, but you want to understand the trust system that is, play, is in place that I base my information on. And that's exactly what Liz and I am trying to share with all the wonderful projects that we have uh, in mind, or not only in mind, that we are uh, uh, place, well, that, that will be going live very soon. So people can, uh, can have the benefits of all that knowledge that we've acquired over the last uh, 20, 30 years based on not only our knowledge, but understanding what is the right kind of knowledge. Who are the people to trust? 
one more personal story. I was asked to become the chairman of TEFAF uh, some five years ago. I've been their chairman for three years. TEFAF is uh, the most reputable art fair in the world, the European Fine Art Fair. It's very interesting because it's not only modern art, like Art Basel, modern and contemporary. It's also antiquities. It's old master paintings. So expertise is hugely important if you want to buy in that field, in those collecting categories. Well, Tefov had the largest independent vetting committee in the world. There were 120, sometimes 140 independent scholars who looked at every artwork that was being sold at that fair, tens of thousands of objects. That's what I call reassurance. Independent people looking at the art that's going to be for sale. And that's why you pay a little bit more money when you buy something at, uh, at Tefov. And those kind of artworks have the biggest chance to go up in value. And I can't tell it enough. I'm, I'm the most boring guy in the world. Be very careful, not because you can't trust the art market, but if you're very savvy with your other investments, why would you just not try to be sure that when you start to invest in art, that it's based upon the right information? And then there's more than just the right information. This is uh, saying it's so good to know and so important to know what to buy, but it's also very important to know when to sell. And when we are starting to create these kind of art fund-like structures, then you also want to make sure that you're dealing with people who understand this is the opportunity to sell. So again, it's prudent portfolio construction, diversification, insider access, which is not like insider trading. Insider access just means that you deal with people who know that market. And uh, then, of course, there is the chance for potential returns when you do it the right way. Well, I think that was extremely well said. I'm going to ask to go to the next slide because I'm curious, something, Elizabeth, you alluded to, that the art returns dramatically outpace the SP 500. And there's a graph to illustrate the point you made. And bear in mind, excluding 2022, which has been a rough time for the SP 500, last time I checked, year to date, our max drawdown was about 21%. I think to today, the drawdown is somewhere around 12 to 14%. But it's, it's come back a little bit, but we're still negative for the year. By the way, the bottom mark is also negative for the year. And part of the reason we're talking about alternative investments is because there are different assets to fold into an efficient portfolio that can counterweight or counterbalance the traditional 60-40 standard allocation that people have been taught to deploy that is not worth this year. So things like art clearly have done well in spite of the financial headwinds. But I just have to remind everybody, the employment report is out tomorrow. It's probably going to be a strong number. The Fed meets next week. They're probably going to raise rates 75 basis points. So we have a lot of headwinds in these financial markets. And investors are looking for a better approach, a new approach, a better solution to create an efficient portfolio. So I'm going to ask Lawrence to comment on this graph that shows that the art 1000 dramatically outpaced the SP 500. So how do you, how do you think about this? And is this the alpha that you were describing before? Well, you know, I'm always looking for uncorrelated assets, right? So, you know, I, you know, I'm a, I'm an economist by training, you know, I, um, and when, when you have, when you combine uncorrelated, you know, returns, it, you know, you know, you move out on the, the efficient frontier, if you will. Right. Um, so the beta, in art is attractive to me as an investor. Um, like I know we're talking about alpha and beta a little bit earlier. Uh, so again, beta is if you were just to uh, put together a random portfolio, if you could, had if you had access and could put together a, a, port, a random portfolio of art, you would get that market beta, if you will, right? Um, but again, as I said earlier, we're all about the alpha, okay? And you know, an alpha. And when I look at you know what uh, what Elizabeth and, and Nana are, are doing, they're creating the alpha, 
right? So like, I, for me to go pick art, I know I knew nothing about art until I met uh, Elizabeth and Nana. I know a tiny bit now, <laughs> but it certainly doesn't qualify me to go out and, and pick works of art, even if I had access to those works of art. So for me, the beta is attractive from an efficient frontier perspective, um, but the alpha, like I look at this as another uh, another market for uh, that we could mine alpha from. And that's what's really attractive to me on this. It's 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 alpha plus the beta is the beta helps as well. All right, well said. And I'd be curious to know the dispersion of returns in art. I'm sure it's dramatic. So when you aggregate several art pieces together, you minimize the volatility of a specific piece. But if you compare it to stocks, and that's not a great analogy. But how do you see individual arts volatility versus the overall index? Um, I, I don't know if I could speak to, to that, but I think what, what's important is that the, um, you know, security selection, okay? I, like art, if I compare it to equities, right? I worked for Steve Cohen for 12 years. He was a master at picking stocks, right? And, you know, I can understand intuitively where he gets that alpha from, right? By and just way, like... Lars, he's a master of picking baseball players as well. The Mets are doing <laughs> pretty well. <laughs> true, true, finally. Um, um, but, uh, you know, but again, in this in this, pay, in this uh, space here, and I'm sure Nana and uh, Elizabeth can, can talk better to the dispersion of individual works, but, you know, yes, diversi diversification can help that, but, you know, having people that know this stuff you know they, they, they you know that they know how to pick uh, the the right pieces of art is so critical in this in this uh, you know in this market probably even more so than the stock market yeah, yeah I, I, sorry Liz you go you go uh, just just to jump in quickly on this one it's 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 important to note that yes art is in some areas largely uncorrelated to uh, other asset classes you have to know which uh, types of artwork you're you're looking at because the art market really is made up of maybe 125 subcategories and they all move in different directions. So all to underline, underscore the importance of getting uh, objective and informed um, information when you're trying to decide what to, to invest in. And just looking at this graph, this is the art price 100. That's the top 100 performing artists. They uh, increased between 2000 and 2020 by about 589% as opposed to the S&P, which went up by 226%. So it's, that's a big, big delta. Uh, you know, if you just look at 200, uh, 2021, which is not on this graph, in 2021, uh, the these top artists went up 36% as opposed to the S&P um, 27%. So, um, but over the over the 20 years that this graph is showing, uh, the art the top artists went up 28% per annum on average as opposed to the S&P, which was about 10.7% increase so there's a big there's a big delta along the way and the, this is these are the kind of artists we're looking for but also just to mention this is talking about the top artists the blue chip artists we just sold an emerging art artist for a client we purchased a work in 2019 for 13,000 we just sold it for just under a million dollars it's over an 8,000 percent increase so you see that at all levels of the market, there are amazing artists to be found. You just have to know and have that information that Nana was talking about in order to make smart, informed decisions about who you're investing in. Well, Elizabeth, when I heard you say the average annual return of S&P over the 20 years, is, I think you said 10.7%, which on a historical basis is kind of its average, but depends on what period you start to do the calculation. So nice return. And I'll just say what it was expected to be, but comparing that to, you know, the top artist index is at 28%. Oh my God, that's almost three X yes. what the S&P 500 did. That's amazing. All right. So clearly this done right has a role in creating a more efficient portfolio. So thank you for that. I'm going to ask Jerry to go to the next slide in the interest of time because I think we're falling behind a little bit. So the key takeaways, I want to open up the questions. I'm sure there will be questions, but um, I'm going to ask Nana first. 
what would you say are the key takeaways that you wanted to share with the audience? The most important takeaway is not every artwork is as tradable as the other. And the moment you start to invest in art, then you have to make sure that you team up with people who understand that market really well. Um, that's the most important takeaway. Whatever technology you build on top of that, what other kind of art funds you want to create, if you don't deal with the people who know that, uh, then it's most likely not the best kind of investment to make. And Liz and I always talk about it. We sometimes go to an art fair together and then we look at art and we say, whoa, I would love to own that piece. But then you look at it because you fall in love with it. But if you have a responsibility for a client, which we have had for many years, then you know this cannot be just a love affair. This should actually be a very rational decision based on real information and real knowledge. And then we look at completely different artworks when we look at it from that perspective. Not every art, not every Picasso is tradable. Picasso is always among the best performing artists. But Liz and I can sit in front of a Picasso and realize this is not the kind of uh, Picasso I would advise anyone to, to invest in. If someone falls in love with it, it's a different kind of story. But this is not about a love affair. This is a rational decision that needs to be made uh, with rational people who want to invest in art, which is an amazing, amazing alternative asset if you deal with it the right way. Thank you for that. Elizabeth, what would you like to share in terms of key takeaways? Obviously, you mentioned it's performance versus it's 500, which is obviously amazing, tremendous. Anything else you want to share before I let Larry give us his final thoughts? Sure. I think that that last bullet point is really important, worth stressing again, uh, and that is that this uh, these due diligence tokens that, that Artery is doing based on, on Winston's uh, due diligence uh, protocol will bring two important um, factors to the art market and make it much more interesting and broaden the number of people who are willing and eager to, to invest, and that is transparency and liquidity the two things that the art market has traditionally lacked. So I think that's an important bullet point to remember. Mark, it's actually quite interesting that Liz is picking up on the bullet point that, that I should be picking up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but it says a lot about our collaboration. <laughs> I'm very proud that we were the first to use blockchain technology in the art market. I've seen many other companies come and go. And we always stuck to that one principle. Yes, our technology has to be the best in class. And it is because we are working for Sotheby's. We're working with Christie's. Uh, we're working for very, very big collectors in the world. We have this joint venture with, with uh, Winston Art Group. But I take technology almost for granted. If that's not good, who cares? So I love the fact that I'm actually explaining what Liz should have been explaining to the people. And Liz who has been one of those very, very early adapters and really believing in technology. Uh, we've had the most incredible journey together where we both coming from the art market, I became more a tech guy, surrounding myself with an incredible tech team in Berlin and acquiring this huge database and making it better and better. Uh, and uh, I hope that's, that that should hopefully be the, the, the best takeaway from the whole, uh, the whole day is when you work with people who you trust and uh, and have uh, additional information uh, and additional uh, additional skill sets and knowledge, then you can achieve a lot. All right, Larry, take us oh, my friend. What do you got? All right, I'll keep it uh, short and sweet. The bottom line is that you know the the beta in art is attractive. The alpha with the right partners is attractive for an investor. And yes, art is illiquid. Uh, but using blockchain technology in order uh, can create that liquidity that currently doesn't exist in art. Okay, well done. I do have some questions from the audience, so I'm just going to throw it out there. My guess is this first question probably is for you, Larry, but let me read a question that Sheila uh, Dobie has asked. It says, how do accredited investors start investing in art What's the minimum capital required to start investing in this asset class? And how long is the typical hold period? Now, you have not yet mentioned the art fund that you are launching now, but I think this is a good 
place to introduce your fund to answer Sheila's question? Um, I, I think, you know, um, I think what you'll see is a, a tokenized art fund coming out at some point in the near future. Um, as an, you know, any, any, it is a security. Anything like that is uh, would be a Reg D uh, in the U.S. So yes, you do have to be an accredited investor. Um, so the holding period for any Reg D tokens, shares, it doesn't debt. It really doesn't matter. It's one year for a for a U.S. investor. Um, and you know, so in uh, the the tokens, you, you can unlike a um, if you invest in a fund, funds usually have high minimums. Usually hundred thousand is your typical minimum to invest in a fund. A tokenized fund, can you can invest with far, far uh, uh, less uh, capital. And that, and that allows you to, you know, to diversify ag across other assets, right? Because, you know, a fund itself is a diversified, uh, you know, a pool of, of, in this case here, of artwork that's been curated. Um, but, you know, you don't need to, you know, Put a million dollars to get access to the beta and the alpha that's inherent in, in art managed by the right people. So, I guess I'm going to throw this to the group, but what is considered a diversified portfolio in this art fund that's about to be launched? So, how many pieces at scale will be in there if someone was to buy a token underlying this portfolio? Liz. <laughs> How much to reveal in advance? Um, it's, it's uh, I would say, in excess of uh, 50 works of art divided between blue chip, mid-career, and emerging, uh, and uh, maybe a five to seven year fund. Um, but you'll, more will be revealed uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. All right. In the, in, in the spirit of sharing people's interest, basically people can reach out to Bridgepoint. And as this opportunity becomes more finalized, we're happy to make the intros and you guys can talk to them one-on-one -on -one and see if there's business to do together. But it sounds like it's very imminent. So the timing of this conversation is, is, is I think, appropriate. Um, I guess there's another question I'm gonna throw out to the group. This is from Rodrigo Esmela. How do you how do you propose to invest via tokenization? I haven't heard a concrete example of tokenized artworks as investment opportunities. So, how does the token play into this fund? Are there other examples of artwork being tokenized to date, or are you the first movers? How do you want to respond to that? Well, but um, maybe first. Oh, sorry, Larry. You can start uh, first. Well, the, the you know I think you know to our knowledge there hasn't been a a, a tokenized art fund. There has been individual pieces tokenized uh, um, uh, by others, but for you know like if I was an investor, right, uh, an average investor, how would I know which tokenized piece to invest in, right? What's my qualifications to select you know whether or not this piece of art is going to you know, perform poorly or, 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 you know, greater poorly. Um, that's why, you know, having that diversification is key. And then you layer on top of that, the alpha from the, from the selection of the pieces, you know, that's what I would be looking for. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to add maybe the, 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 the other tokenization element of tokenizing the due diligence processes of Winston art group and giving permission based access to future investors to have access to that information. Um, it's, uh, it's privileged information that's going to be out there, not to be seen by everyone, of course, uh, but again, adding a new layer of reassurance uh, for the people investing in these kind of artworks, whether it's in a fund or in a singular artwork. Okie dokie. Um, I have a question from the audience again. This is from Michael Jalaman. And the question is, what are the criteria that you use for evaluating emerging artists? Where is the highest upside and risk? Shall I jump in on that one? Yeah, I was going to throw that to you, Elizabeth, but you volunteered, so you don't <laughs> you have to go right. 
Well, the, I mentioned before that we do we have this protocol of, of over 50 different data points that we look at when we're looking to possibly invest in a work of art. Uh, emerging artists um, are super interesting. There are many, many of them out there. So what we're looking for are some kind of, um, first of all, looking at the work of art and saying, is there something unique about this style, about this artist, about this, uh, this medium? Uh, and then we look at and see who the dealer is and have the works been shown in any exhibitions? Are there any, any museum exhibitions planned? Who has purchased them before? Any institutional purchasing? Any major collectors purchasing? Uh, and then there's a, whole, there's a whole list. I'd be very happy to speak in more detail about the list of criteria we look for, but that's, that gives you a sort of a basic um, outline of some of the things we, we first start to look at with an emerging artist. Can I, in simplistic terms, and I'm a simplistic guy, call what you just described market validation, that these are endorsements from opinion leaders that help establish who are the up-and-comers that are going to do well? Is that fair? It's, it's even Yeah, it's even pre-market validation, Liz, isn't it? I mean, it is. market it is. validation is one thing, but having uh, the network of people to understand there's even a pre-market validation is, I believe, for investors, incredibly important because that's not the usual knowledge you have when you start buying art. Okay. It, 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 sounds, it sounds almost awkward maybe for people not from the art market, but when Liz and I are at the big art fair and we see one person heading into a booth buying a few pieces, if you know that kind of person and you know his or her network, then it's almost a pre-market validation that's that's happening right at that very moment, and 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 having the knowledge to see that happening is is important. So can I call, can I call that follow the smart money? Is that possible? <laughs> well, it's a little bit more than that, but still. I, I know I'm just trying to simplify. I, I, it. Yeah. But sure enough. I would, I would also add one other thing, and that is access to certain works of art, because emerging artists are extremely hot, and you have to get in there and purchase quickly uh, if you want to be able to get them. But not everybody has access to um, to, to works of art, and the, the dealers are very selective about who they'll let purchase works of art. So it's all about access as well, and that's something that, uh, that we're lucky enough to have uh, have good access to a, a very broad range of emerging artists and galleries. And that's built up over years of working with those galleries with their, with their artists. Okay, I have three more questions, but I'm also trying to be mindful of the time. We scheduled this call to be one hour and we're approaching the one hour mark. So I have three questions left. I'm going to ask the audience to, I guess, end their questions and I'll try to wrap up with these three remaining questions, that's okay. So I have a question from R Rodrigo Esmola. How, how do you get from a due diligence token to liquidity? That's the question. Well, maybe part one is that the due diligence tokens refers to one single artwork. Um, so you always know that it's uniquely representing all the information that you need to know about that single artwork. And then you start on the trading side, and maybe there Larry can uh, can, can can come in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Really, we have there's two different use cases of blockchain that we're speaking about today. One is the the using the blockchain for the diligence, as Nadi was just described describing, and then there is the um, uh, putting that security that you know that tokenized fund on a blockchain to enable secondary market trading. So they're two very different things. And again, you know, I was speaking more to the um, enabling that secondary market liquidity. Okay, we're down to two final questions. So we're almost at the end. So Trey, his question, it's, I'll say it's more of a commentary, but you can give feedback on his comment. He says, when I sell my art, I've cheated as real estate in the sense I look at price per square inch. So a little painting is cheaper than big painting in my simple language. So I guess the question is, um, how would an artist like myself scale my paintings to six or seven figures and the lucrative luc lucrativity of turning my paintings into NFTs powered by said tokens where it be nine by 18 or nine by 27 per painting. I don't know if I asked that 
phrased properly or not, but his question, I think, is how would he turn his art into NFTs? Well, that that's such a great subject, and and that's definitely worth a, an, another podcast, I would say, um, because we all realized that the te technology that Artry is using. Um, all of a sudden became very popular because certain artists or people who want to become artists started to use the same technology to create an artwork where exactly the technology we are using um, also represents a reel or an image and then that NFT becomes the artwork. Our NFTs so far are solely representing a physical artwork. Um, having said that, Liz and I are of course always looking at art and we understand that the NFT art, as, as not as physical art, but as digital art, is here to stay. And it could be a very interesting uh, future category to include in these kind of funds. Um, because artists will always try, find new ways to express themselves. And the NFT technology is certainly a way be, that will, hear, will, will be used in the future by the artist as well. But for now, our technology is all based on representing credible information of physical artwork to give more reassurance for investors that they're dealing with the right kind of art. Well, again, very well said. And we're at that point where I have to end it. It breaks my heart because I think I could spend three more hours talking to you guys about art world, tokenization, picking the alpha in the art world. But you certainly presented a very compelling case why this asset class is an efficient portfolio. So I thank everyone, not only for their knowledge and insights, but, but also sharing that knowledge and insights with our audience, et cetera. If anyone in the audience wants to follow up with any of our speakers, we have my and my co-founder Nadia's contact information. Please reach out to us. We're happy to share any and all questions and comments to the uh, speakers today. And again, on behalf of Bridgepoint Capital, Elizabeth, Nana, and Larry, you guys were great. So really, thank you so much for your time. I know I certainly got a, a lot out of this, and I'm sure our audience did too. So thank you. Wonderful. Great. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thanks. A pleasure. Yeah. All right. And have a great day, everybody. And we'll talk to everyone next Thursday, and we'll be speaking soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care.